You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jay Green. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Business Essentials for Authors is your Business 101 guide for the publishing industry. Whether you've never published at all or are looking to take your professional career up a notch in an easy-to-read and conversational way, the book covers the five pillars of business. We look at all of this and more from a long-term strategic view. How to get the plan done and the mindset to make it all work. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to four, that's the number four, thewords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat in the chair, hand on keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off 
a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jane Green on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book called The Friends We Keep, and it's guaranteed to be one of the best summer reads that you'll pick up. Uh, Welcome to the show, Jane. Oh, thank you. It's lovely to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you. Um, Jane, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, well, the truth is, I never wanted to be a writer or a storyteller. Um, I, I love honest I answers. Be, I thought I was going to be an artist. Um, and, uh, and actually, the truth is, I think that I became a writer because I was a reader and I was a very shy, somewhat awkward child who felt that she didn't quite fit in. And the place where I found my solace and my joy was always within the pages of books. And and as you can hear, I grew up in the UK, I grew up in London, and I would pray for rainy days because rainy days meant we didn't have to go outside for recess. We could curl up on these bean bags in the library and I could just lose myself in books. So um, I, I'm certain that that's why I became a writer. Um, but I, it, it was never something that I, I anticipated. I love that. I, I think there are more people like you. Um, then we know, I, I think that uh, it can be an infectious thing that, uh, we get lost in stories. Therefore, uh, the natural thing is to want to create our own at some point. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Do you remember a certain book, author or series that just really brought you in and captured your imagination? Oh my goodness. Well, I remember my favorites when my favorites when I was young um, included. I I mean, I fell in love with America, actually, back then through Laura Ingalls Wilder. Mm. And and also there was a series, What Katie Did. I think it was by Susan, Susan, I want to say Cooper. I'm not sure if that's right. But there were it was a trilogy and they were wonderful. And um, and I I fell in love continue to fall in love with America through the What Katie Did series. And I also love the books by Nancy Mitford, um, who who was from this, this very aristocratic British family, and she became a novelist and wrote The Pursuit of Love, which I absolutely adored. But I was always reading. I read every anything and everything. That's wonderful. Um, I remember reading those Laura Ingalls Wilder, Wilder books myself, and then I read them to my kids as they were growing up. And oh. those are such timeless, fantastic books. Uh, yeah. Adventure yeah. And, and everything. They're, they're wonderful. Absolutely. Yep. And I, I, and I remember as well the book. Oh, goodness. I'm forgetting who it's by. Heidi. The yes. book Heidi. I don't, and and I, I read that to my daughter. Um, when when she was small, which also I I completely loved. Um, who was Heidi by? I, I can't remember, but they Joanna, they were all Joanna, around. I've got it, Joanna Spiry Spiry. Um, but oh my gosh, I love that book. It's fantastic. Um, you said that you thought that you would be an artist. Do you mean a visual artist? Yes, I thought I would be either a, a visual artist or a, or a designer of some kind, um, a graphic designer perhaps. And, uh, and then I fell into journalism and found that I, I really loved the writing. I, I didn't so much love the getting of the story. I was a feature writer, um, but I really, really loved the writing. And I found that I could lose myself for hours and time would just pass in a flash. Um, and, and playing with the words and telling stories, I, I just loved. And then when I was 27, one of my great friends who was an art historian suddenly phoned up and said that she'd written a book. And she and I had shared our mutual love of books for since we were tiny little girls. We always read the same books and discussed them. 
and and suddenly she was writing a book herself and the next phone call came and she'd got a publishing deal and I remember thinking hang on a minute I'm the writer I was working as a journalist and and I thought if she can do it then I can do it too and I somewhat naively left my job and gave myself three months to write a book and get a publishing deal which was madness madness with hindsight and yet I did it there was two days before that three month period was up there was a bidding war for my first novel and and here I am 23 years later that is that is crazy that um, Mm -hmm. you know we hear so many stories of of toiling in the trenches for years and years Um, do, do you credit that to anything in particular um should we all give ourselves such a tight deadline to to make the magic happen oh my god no uh, <laughs> nobody must do that um, but you know well i i will say first of all i was in the uk um secondly it was at a very different time i think it was a combination of writing the right book at the right time it was it was just around the time that bridget jones's diary was coming out she i think she i I wrote my book, um, we were writing our books at the same time and and hers came out and it paved the way for for books like that that were relatable. It was the really, Bridget Jones's Diary was the first book that was about real women and and I was writing exactly the same sort of thing, having read Nick Hornby's book, High Fidelity, which every man I knew was saying, oh, this book's about me. Um, and I thought, well, no, I, you know, no one's done this for women yet, so I'm going to do this for women. Of course, little did I know that Helen Fielding was, was in her flat in Westbourne Grove writing Bridget Jones' diary. So, so we had the same idea at the same time, I think. And, and it started a whole new genre because up until that time, women's beach reads, women's commercial fiction were were sort of blockbusters like Judith Krantz and Barbara Taylor Bradford and they were very glitzy and very aspirational but none of them featured real women like us with all their foibles and insecurities and the things they were going through. So so I I am enormously proud to have been part of something that, that really introduced a new genre in in literature in women's fiction absolutely um when you're when you're setting out to to blaze a trail like that and and this is something brand new for you brand new for uh for the publishing industry you know in in that that you really helped to found the genre um did you other than the um the books for men that that uh that everyone was relating to was there uh, any other sort of um, idea that you were working with, or was this just your this the first idea that came to you? Kind of, where did the idea this for this was, particular story come from? Yeah, no, th- this was really. I wanted to write a book that was absolutely real about the terrible men that I dated and <laughs> the same terrible men that my girlfriends were dating, and and I I wrote what was at the time a really groundbreaking raw real, funny, warts and all tale of a group of girlfriends in their early 30s and and their lives and and the men and the jobs and their friendship and um and it really all stemmed from from high fidelity. Wow. At 20 some odd books later, uh you're you're still um, writing, publishing, and uh, people are flocking to your books as the the must read uh, of the summer. How do you maintain um, the the freshness of your stories so that you are constantly breaking new ground? Yeah, well, I, I have to say sometimes it's really, really hard. Um, not all books are equal. Um, I you. You, I don't believe that anybody can love the writing of every single book. And some of the books that I've written have been incredibly hard and and have just taken much more work than others to get right. You know, there's the the some of them are really easy and they it feels like they write themselves. The words come pouring out. And you know that you've got it right first draft and that it needs very little work. And then there are other books that require 
extensive rewrites. I have to say the friends we keep required extensive rewrites. Now I'm, I'm thrilled with, with where I got the book to. I'm, I'm really proud of it, but it was a huge amount of work to get there. It wasn't an easy book to write. Whereas um, I'm writing my 21st novel now and it's completely different. It's a, it's all set in, in um, Silicon Valley and it's the story of a of the 29-year-old daughter of a Steve Jobs-like tech titan um, who's who's struggling to find herself. And and I'm loving it again. So you just never know. Um, and uh, I, I guess my, my hope is that I will always have stories to tell. I, I really appreciate the, the fact that, that you um, – talked about how difficult uh, it is sometimes because that is something that every writer goes through some days and some stories just flow like they're coming from from on high and and we're just the the channel that you know um that the story goes through and sometimes yeah. it is actual real work um i never would have guessed that the friends we keep was uh was a struggle in writing uh it it yeah. flows so naturally and it's such a um, such an engaging book. Um, what are some things that you've learned along the way when, when you do have a project like that, um, that how do you find the magic in something that just doesn't feel like the magic is there? Well, um, so the first thing I have to say is my earliest lesson was my best lesson, which was working as a journalist on a, on a daily national newspaper called the Daily Express in, in the UK. Every day I had an editor standing over me saying, Jane, we need a thousand words on X in an hour. And I couldn't say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not inspired today. Try me again tomorrow. <laughs> I had to come up with a thousand words on whatever topic I was given because it was my job. And that is the way that I have always treated writing. It's my job and I have to do it whether I feel like it or not. But as you just said, that doesn't mean that there are not days when it is like squeezing blood from a stone. But what I have found, there are a couple of things that the days when it's really, really hard. Um, well, first of all, you, it just requires tremendous discipline. You, I sit down and I will not leave my desk until a certain number of words are on the page. And I, if those words are terrible, if I hate them, that's fine. I can I can come back and rewrite them, but I have to get those words on the page. But, you know, something always happens that when I push through those blocks, at a certain point, suddenly a sentence will come that's really good or or an idea. And, and suddenly it starts to flow. The only way to unlock the creativity is to write your way through it. But... I will also say that there are times that if you get stuck, it's often because you don't know enough. You don't know enough about your character. And sometimes stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something, um, reading a, a biography or, or going, going out and doing something unusual can actually stimulate that creativity. I actually find trains, planes and automobiles the best place for me to um, come up with ideas and also long walks. I'm lucky enough to live right by the beach. Um, and sometimes I will take myself off on a very long walk and I, you, you people will see me muttering to myself and I'm, I'm figuring out that my characters and my, my storyline when I get stuck. You know, people say that, uh, that you need to really work on, on two things to be a great writer, and that's reading a lot and writing a lot. Um, but I like to add a third, and I think getting away from, from the computer or the notepad or whatever it is that you're using and, and interacting with people or, or going to watch people and listening to people talk, uh, invariably, uh, opens things up for me uh, a lot of times just uh, uh, it's the yeah. rhythm and cadence of conversation and just watching people is amazing i i completely agree and 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 i'd even expand the idea to to you have to live enough of a life in order to have something to write about right. and not that we're necessarily writing about our lives but but 
it, it, it's all inspiration. And the more that you can get out there, the more experiences you can have, the more people you can meet and things you can do, the better it serves you in your writing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about the new book, The Friends We Keep. Um, how did this story come to you? Well, oh, how did the story come to me? I think it was really that as as a middle-aged woman, and I'm, I'm 51, just turned 51, so I, I realized that I have great friends, I love my life, I have a wonderful husband, lots of children, and yet my life is much more isolated than I ever expected. Now, partly you could argue that I'm a novelist, I'm, I, I'm something of an introvert, but when I speak to my friends who are not novelists, so many of us are feeling the same way. And, and I think a lot of it is down to technology that we're all hiding behind our screens. And, and I'm as guilty of it as anyone. I mean, heaven forbid my phone should ring. I now look at it in horror thinking, <laughs> why can't you text me like a normal person? Um, but we are all increasingly dealing with loneliness. Um, and, and I suddenly realized that my husband and I kept finding ourselves going out to dinner with our favorite friends. And we'd all and always end up in the same conversation, which went something along the lines of, wouldn't it be amazing if we bought a piece of land somewhere or a farm and we all lived together with our favorite people, but we each had our own tiny house and then maybe a communal barn that had a big kitchen and a living room. And, and we have this, this fantasy that we talk about with friends so that we don't have to go into the, the, what Jung called the afternoon of life on our own. And the more we talked about it, the more excited I could see people getting. I, I started to think, oh, I really need to write a novel about this, about a group of friends that perhaps meet at university, swear that they'll be best friends forever, um, but then they lose touch because life gets in the way. And when they each when they each find one another again at their 30th reunion, they what starts off as a joking fantasy, wouldn't it be great if we lived together again, becomes reality. Except because this is a novel, there is a deep, dark secret that one of them harbors that threatens to derail everything that they, they've found. The this book uh, is is classified as uh, as women's fiction uh, because you know for for whatever reason we we feel like we have to uh, classify things down to uh, the minutia for for bookstores yeah. and Amazon and, and, and things like that. Um, yeah. But this really is a timeless story that is uh, has appeal for every reader. This is something we all go through, women, men. Um, these are are situations that. Uh, that really cross all boundaries. Um, oh. Is that anything that you, is that something that you think about at all when you're writing uh, about your target audience and, and how people will perceive these characters in the story? Well, I, I don't tend to. I tend to write the stories I need to tell, and I hope that my audience comes with me. But it's, but I love what you just said about it being timeless because uh, publishing is, is really struggling right now. Um, and nobody quite knows what to do. Uh, people aren't reading in the way that they used to. Books aren't selling in the way that they used to. And I think in recent years, publishers have decided that the beach read is, is their opportunity to, to make a big splash. Um, and so they're labeling everything as a beach read that comes out in, you know, from May onwards. And which, which I think often does a disservice to the book because I have many friends who are writing really insightful, thoughtful, deep books, novels about Alzheimer's and, and, and illness and, and real issues and, and dark issues that we go through in our lives. And then finding that the publisher has slapped a cover on of somebody in a bathing suit in a swimming pool <laughs> and, they're, and they're rolling it out as a beach read. Um, and of course, what happens with a beach read is, you know, it's hot this year and then that's it. It's done. And, and I'm not sure that I've, I've ever particularly written beach reads. And yet I would also argue, what is a beach read? It's anything that you enjoy reading on the beach. So, um, yes slightly torn on, on that question well yeah um I, and i and 
Understandably so. Um, but, you know, that that's one reason why we have such a diversity of authors on the show, um, because I, I think that that we need to open our our palettes a little bit. Stories uh, are, you know, should connect with us on a heart level and yes. and and we should kind of put away our preconceived notions and prejudices because uh this is this is a fantastic book that I think is is great for everyone. Um, tell us a little bit about the characters in this book and and who they are and um, what the the um, I'm trying to think of a way to ask this where we don't give away too much. But there's a these people are are sharing something that uh, uh, how how did the story come to you and and what is the the situation they find themselves in. Well, um, so how to tell the story without without giving too much away. Um, so my characters are Evie, um, and Evie is is really my protagonist, my main protagonist, and she is um, half Jamaican, half American. Lived with her Jamaican mother and her waspy, wealthy father who has been cut off from his wealthy banking family because he didn't marry the right sort of girl um, in in New York. But the the marriage is actually one that, that um, is abusive um, and is violent. And eventually, Evie's mother has enough and she picks up Evie and she takes her to London to move in with, with her mother, who is now has left Jamaica for London. And Evie is a former child actress who has always struggled with her weight. Um, because she was an actress, she, she was constantly put on diets from when she was very young. And she, from the outside, she looks as if she has everything. In fact, it's something that all the characters share. They all look as if they, are, they have everything in their lives that they could possibly want. But actually, all of them are, are struggling in some way. And, and Evie is riddled with insecurities and um, she goes to become a model which of course only feeds not only the insecurities but an eating disorder some issues she has with food because she has to stay very very slim as a model and then she finds herself repeating the the abusive relationships of her of her parents I mean she she really has disastrous relationships with men and Evie is the one who is carrying the secret from her university days, which is why she, she withdraws from the other two. And the other two are Topher. And Topher is from Greenwich, Connecticut, and he's larger than life. And he is, when we meet him, he is, he describes himself as asexual. But in fact, by the end of their days at university, he realizes that he's gay, although Intimacy is incredibly hard for him, and he tends to keep all romantic prospects at arm's length, and we find out why later on in the story. Um, and then there is Maggie, who comes from this very jolly, big, upper crust English country family, and, and the only thing she wants in life is the life that she had as a child. She wants a husband, lots of children, lots of animals, and a big country house with, filled with chaos. Um, and of course, she doesn't get what she wants at all. Um, there is another character who is, in fact, the first person we meet, Ben. And, and Ben features significantly in the story. Um, and uh, and we we follow the ups and downs of their lives across thirty years until they meet again with every secret um, that we know has to come out. Um, but we're really we we it's what's going to happen to everybody once the secret does come out. What I love about this book is it's really a story about family and the the family we inherit uh, that we have nothing to do with, and then the family that we choose. Uh, to have and the people that we carry with us forward and the uh, sometimes juxtaposition of those things, sometimes the um, contrast of those things. Uh, but it it's really about uh, about the human condition and, and the, the choices that we make along with that. Um, I, I absolutely love the book. Oh, Hank, thank you. You have completely made my day. <laughs> Um, Jane, what what are you working on now? Uh, because I know in in the publishing industry there are, you know, this book has probably been finished for a year or, or so, and you said you're working on your twenty first book, uh, and, and that the new book is flowing 
uh, well. What what can we expect uh, from you next year? Um, well, oh, I don't know. Um, I, but I think, um, well, this my new book will be hopefully coming out next summer. But I, I'm, I'm hoping to. I'm hoping to develop one of my books into a screenplay or a TV show. That that's really I'm ready for a new challenge. Um, I did do a deal um, fairly recently with a with a, a cable channel who bought three of my books and turned them into films, and uh, I had nothing to do with it other than than writing the original books. And I never ever want to do that again. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> next time I I have to be involved in the script. I have to be involved in everything, actually. Next, I, I think I'm too much of a control freak. It, it was, I thought I'd be fine with it, and everybody advised me to just sell and walk away, and, and, and I, I wish I hadn't done that now. So um, it's fine. We learn from our experiences, but I really want to develop my next project myself. Uh, a TV series would be amazing, yeah. too, where you it have the a- room to really develop. Uh, that would be fantastic. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jane, um, if people are just learning about you, uh, God forbid, and want to learn more about your back catalog and follow along with news and, and everything that's going on, uh, is there a place they can find you and connect with you online? Yeah. Well, I have a, I do have a website, which is janegreen.com. But the very best place of all to, to follow my life and find out everything that's going on is Instagram. And I, I love Instagram. What I love most about Instagram are the Instagram stories where you make these little, if you click on someone's profile picture, it takes you to their stories, which are all these little, I make these little videos where I talk to the camera and I have huge fun. And I feel like it's the place where I'm most myself. Um, so Instagram, I think I'm Jane Green author on Instagram. So that's where to find me. Jane Green author. Yes, I am. I'm looking now. <laughs> Instagrams where all the good vibes are, where all the yes. all the happy posts are. Well, and that's exactly it. I gave up Twitter a few years ago after I Oof. found myself embroiled in a in a Twitter drama, and uh, it just I I'm not interested in Twitter. Yeah. Too, Twitter too can be a bit negativity. of a dumpster fire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. Well, Jane, it's been so much fun talking to you. We're going to send everybody to uh, to see you and to pick up their copy of The Friends We Keep. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, Hank, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. I was ten years old when I saw my first ghost. The year was 1770. My father was a barber. He kept a small shop at the Kuenhoven Inn, where the King's Road met the Old Loop. Our modest home lay to the north, between the inn and the hanging tree. A simple box of pine boards, whitewashed with crushed oyster shell, one room with a spinning wheel for mother, a chair for father, and up a ladder of branches, a garret where my parents slept. I slept on the floor below, alongside my little brother, Hans, five years younger than I. Our floor sloped toward the Hudson, so that when Hans rolled over in his sleep, he often went on rolling and couldn't stop, collecting splinters and grievances. Yet on this particular night, he slept peacefully, and I was the fitful one. A mouse had taken shelter in our wall, fleeing the October chill. It scritched and scratched, nibbling a nest for itself. The sound thrilled me. I possessed a vivid mind, full of toadstools and bullfrogs and lightning storms, and so imagined a skeleton writhed in the wood. The bones of Anne Underhill, perhaps, murdered by Indians at Spook Rock. I'd heard that tale from my father, who reveled in the Dutch superstitions. He would gather us to fireside on winter nights and spin tales of the Heer of Dunderberg, that storm king who rattled our white windows of the Lady of Raven Rock, who died in snowfall, pining for her lover, of trolls beneath the penny bridge and hobgoblins in the hanging tree. He'd filled my head with such dark romance that I lay waiting for Anne's little finger bones to drag me off to some bloody fate. I rather hoped she would. A cloud cleared the moon, and a square of light fell on my mother's spinning wheel. 
The sharp spindle glinted and the wheel began to turn without touch. A figure appeared before me as through a mist, a gray head bent to the work. She fixed me with eyes black as open graves and whispered in a low guttural hiss, Spin or you shall not eat. I cried out and fell to my pallet, arms over my head. Hans awoke, lost his balance, and rolled away, bleeding with pain as he struck the riverside wall. Father emerged above. Agatha, what is wrong? There's a ghost, Papa. A ghost, help me. Hans laughed despite his bruises, and Mother moaned and ordered us to sleep. But Papa descended and took my hands, his blue eyes twinkling. What did you see? An old woman. She said, spin or you shall not eat. Oh, he raised a candle beneath his chin. You saw old Willow. She lived here long ago, when this was the home of Isaac Hart, our candle maker. Her husband was killed by savages. Hart took her in at the request of Lord Phillips, who paid a token sum for her upkeep. But Hart was greedy and kept the money for himself. He never fed her unless she spun. So Willow spun and spun and spun like a spider, year by year, growing old and blind and falling to waste. She died at that spinning wheel, fell over one day, and the spindle pierced her heart. Hans screamed and hid beneath the table. Mother appeared above. Daniel Van Ripper, you are a fool. I kissed Papa's fingers, for I loathed that spinning wheel. I'd be no toothless ghost, spinning and haunting little girls. I felt pity for such a spirit and gratitude to have her example before me, stealing my resolve. Every night thereafter, I would leave a crust of bread for old Willow and sleep with one eye open in case she came to spin for me again.